So Jonah, I kept, I kept going, what, what's the deal here, Lord? But he kept laying it on my heart so deep. And then there was some instances that, that are personal instances to me where he just confirmed it. And that's what I'm saying all along. When you guys start following and when you start hearing that voice, there's, there's some intimate times, just like intimate times with your wife that you don't, it's not for personal, it's, you don't want to share it. It's just between you and him. And he gave me some things like that th- this time to let me know that that's really what he wanted me to preach on. So you guys have all heard the Jonah story before, Jonah and the whale and all this. I'm going to talk about the verses that you've probably never heard about, which, which come from Jonah 4. Excuse me, this is a very short book. It's you should all get it out and read it today. You can read it real fast. This thing's like an onion. There's so many layers when I started reading it. There's so many lessons to learn in it that that you're just going to have to ask the Lord to lead you through it. You know, as kids, all we've heard is this story about the whale. And this is, you know, we we reduce everything down to to this stuff when there's a powerful lesson in this. And if the Lord gives us time, we're going to link this with with John 11 and a story about Lazarus. And then we're going to talk about a lot of verses of waiting. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Um, I'll just start by paraphrasing the beginning of Jonah. You guys know that story, but I'll give you a paraphrase until we get to verse 4 and then I'll pick it up and read that. What the deal was was Jonah was called by the Lord to to go and preach against the city uh, Nineveh and he was called to, to preach against this city and instead of doing that Jonah ran away and he, he jumped on a ship going the opposite way from the city and start heading out to sea and running away from the Lord. And, you know, I, I've i done that before. I know that there's many of y'all out there who have done that before. And, you know, Jonah found himself not too far out, on, and then the, the uh, seas got rough, and things got rough, and the, the guys that were in the ship started blaming it on him because he had told him that he was running for the, from the Lord. So they were saying, you know, all this is because of you. So we're going to toss you over overboard. So they throw him overboard, and then you get to verse two, um, uh, chapter two. Before that, it said, "But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights." And that's we know is a foreshadowing too of of what Jesus did for us. But I want us to stop before I go on to that and think about Jonah being inside this fish. And, and the idea that came to me on this was, was we're waiting. And what do you do when you're waiting? What do you do when, see, Jonah was in this, this whale. He wasn't really, he wasn't dead, but was he, he wasn't really alive. And a lot of times in our life, we find ourselves in these positions, a state of limbo. What, what are we? What do we do? What, where are we going? You know, he, he was alive, but he couldn't really live his life, could he? Because he's in this fish. But he's not dead either. And a lot of this happens to us sometimes when we have an injury or something. I've had back injury before where I didn't feel alive. I didn't feel dead. I was in this state of limbo. Well, the question is, what do I do? What do you do when you're in the state of this limbo? Well, what, what I'm going to show you from Scripture is you pray. You pray. And that's what Jonah did when we pick up at, at chapter 2. It said, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed. And I'm not going to read that whole prayer, but he starts off, and if y'all read that, it's a pretty amazing prayer from inside the fish. You know, He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. This is while he was still in the fish. So he's, he's talking about the Lord had delivered him times before. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. See, what Jonah shows is the Lord has compassion for us. That's a theme of this, this chapter, this whole, every chapter, the, the whole book. And so then we get uh, on further in the story, and it said, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So what the Lord did is he had him, the fish save him, even though it looked like it was going to kill him. See, his ways aren't our ways. A lot of times something looks dead. And it's really just a transportation device to make it fully alive. And see, we don't really understand that. And I believe that's what happened with this radio station. And, you know, it's what's happening with a lot of people out there. If you're going through an illness or a sickness or you're in this state of limbo, pray. Pray. 
and and that's what we're supposed to do and what the deal is i'm not saying when you're waiting you're just doing nothing you're waiting you're praying and then when you hear his voice and you hear him tell you to do something you do it no matter what no matter what you're waiting you hear his voice waiting praying you hear his voice and then you do it when he tells you personally to do something you have to do it no matter what see but most people aren't taking the time of waiting they're not engaging in earnest prayer so they don't hear his voice so they can't do what he's commanding them to do and we end up in our own ways just running away from him here and there all the time okay so after the lord had commanded him and he spit him out onto dry land the word of the lord came to jonah a second time and he told him to do the same thing that he told him to do the first time and this time jonah listens so he goes and he preaches against the city and they they listen somewhat they they make superficial ways of following god they're not going in it with their full heart they're kind of superficial but god is is acknowledging that they're trying to seek him in some way and it's showing that that little steps towards god mean a lot and they bring out his compassion that it's just when we dull down and we don't go to him with our heart that that we miss out you know so it said when god saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways he had compassion on them and he didn't bring upon them the the destruction that he had threatened Okay? And I'm praying for that, that, that this destruction that, that's threatened for the radio doesn't come through. I'm praying that if you're, you have illness and sickness out there, that this destruction that's being threatened is not going to happen, that you're going to tap into the Lord's compassion by following him, by making a turn to the right direction, by seeking him, seeking him, seeking him, and praying, praying your heart, praying earnestly, seeking him, and, and laying it out. Now, when we get to chapter 4, I'm going to read this whole thing, because this is the part of it that you guys have never heard. And this is the part that I'm not going to tell you what it means. There's so many layers in this. You're going to have to ask the Lord for yourself what it means. I, I'm going to tell you maybe parts of what it means for me. But um, there's so many lessons in this. And just listen and go back and read it yourself. We're at Jonah 4. He said, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. And I want, I want us to hold on to that. Okay, because he got displeased and became angry. Jonah didn't really have the greatest attitude as you look at, at him in this story. But God showed him compassion as well. And, and, but what I want us to focus on is what did Jonah do when he became greatly displeased and angry? The next verse says he prayed to the Lord. Well, see, so many times we get upset or something, we hold it to ourselves. He sees that anyway. He's wanting you to sit down with him and just talk that thing out. Give him your heart. Tell him what the deal is. Tell him how you feel. And then trust on him to deliver you. Okay? Said, so, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Oh Lord, this is not what I said. Is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And what the deal is here is this is what Jonah knew. He knew these were like a wicked people, and he was actually upset that the Lord had showed him compassion. And he said, I knew this was what was going to happen. They were going to give you, themselves to you in some superficial way. You were going to show them compassion. It was going to actually dull down my uh, warning to them or whatever. So you see that he doesn't have the greatest attitude in this thing either. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, set in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade, for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh, 
has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well, should I not be concerned about that great city? And that's how the story of Jonah ends. And it's a strange way to end. You're kind of left hanging on a cliff. What does all this mean? Well, it's like Jesus said so many times, go learn what this means. And, and so I know the things that he showed me out of this. I want you all to look at that. What I'm getting is, what do we do when we're waiting? We're praying. We're, we're being earnest with him. We're telling him what is in our heart. And he's working all that out with us. He does that with Jonah. He's, he, sometimes it looks like we're, we're dying and he's really saving us. And it reminded me of the Lazarus story, and I don't have time to read it or go fully into it, but I want y'all to look at uh, John 11 and go back and read that whole thing because that's, that's the thing too. He let Lazarus die. They called on him. He didn't come, it said, for two more days. By the time he got there, Lazarus was dead for four days. Everybody thought, well, man, why did you let him die? See, they were thinking that he could save him from dying, but they weren't thinking that he could resurrect him from the dead. Sometimes Jesus doesn't come and lets things get past the point that we think that they can be resurrected so he can come in resurrected and get the glory, get all the glory for it. And we know that it's him, and he does that to blow up our faith. And one of the verses that he said in, in, uh, in uh, the, the John 11 account of Lazarus, I love it at the beginning when they said the one you love is sick and he's calling on you. Jesus said at this point, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. See, that's what every part of our life is about. It's about giving glory to him. And I'm trusting that he's going to come through in some way and reveal his glory. And I know that he will if we keep trusting in him to do that. And so I just wanted to take a second and look about waiting, look about what the Bible says about what you're doing when you're waiting. And once again, waiting is just to the point where you hear his voice. And then when you hear his voice individually telling you what to do, you do it. It No matter what it looks like, no matter what anybody says, if you know it's from him. But see, most people never develop that relationship, never work at him to, to really hear what he's saying. So then when he says something, whispers it to him, and he said, well, that isn't him. And I'm going to do what I want to do. And well, I, that isn't the way people do it. You know, his ways aren't our ways. You got to wait, pray, listen to his voice, do it. Okay, I'm going to take a sip of coffee real quick. So when we look at waiting... I looked up waiting. What that means is to remain inactive or in a state of repose as until something expected happens. You're waiting on something to happen. That's why I wanted to play that song while we're waiting. It's an action. We're praying. We're waiting on something to happen. We're waiting on him to speak to somebody individually and them to do what he's saying. Okay. The second definition is to be available or in readiness. Okay. Modern man doesn't wait. We, we don't know what that is. We don't wait for anything. We got to wait a couple of seconds. We, we get uncomfortable. We start getting grumpy. We start taking it out on people. We do nasty. We don't know how to wait. Okay. That's something I've learned from, from farming and, and growing things. It, it takes a lot of time. I plant this stuff. I got to wait on it for a couple months sometimes, you know, to give me the fruit. And you, and that's part of this walk with Christ. Okay, so we've defined waiting, and now we're going to look at what the Bible says about waiting. It's Psalm 27, 14. He says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 135, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. He repeats it again. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Isaiah thirty eighteen. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Acts 1, 4. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father has promised. 
Romans 8, 23, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly. We're groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. <clears throat> but hope that is already seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. First Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Titus 2.13 While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious happening of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've been hanging on this verse. It's been a personal verse for me that's been like a time release. And, and it's helped me get through this this time of waiting, you know. I, I can't imagine how, how Richard feels with, with his whole life. And even guys like Locke that have spent 25 years doing a show on here. Richard, 40-something years or more here. You know, more than that. I, I, I've been here for two years. I feel like I'm losing my church, and it, it rips my heart out. But I believe that he's going to come through. I'm trusting him. No matter what, no matter what he does with this thing, I'm, I'm trusting him. I've been hanging on to this verse, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. See, he's calling us to overflow with hope. To overflow with hope. No matter what, even if this thing dies, I'm waiting the resurrection. And if he doesn't do that, he's doing something better. I don't understand his ways. It looked like Jonah was dead. He got thrown in the water, dead one time. Bam. Fish grabs him, dead another time. But he's not dead. He's alive. He's in there praying. He's in there growing. And then when he got out, he did what the Lord told him to do. See, that's, that's what we're doing right now. Okay, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, I'm not overflowing by hope by Brad. In Brad, there ain't a lot of hope. But this Holy Spirit that lives in me keeps testifying to me every second that there's hope. And I need to hold on to it. And there's good things around the corner and hold on to it. And don't give up and persevere and believe me. Believe all the things that I told you on the mountain. See, you can't just love him in the good times. You gotta love him in the good times and the bad times. And if you're going through a time out there with sickness or with with injury or like this radio station, whatever, and I don't wanna make the radio station something like somebody's illness of a life or death thing. But this radio station is a person and it serves a lot of people and it's dying. But if you're going through that where you don't feel fully alive today and you don't feel dead and you're waiting, earnestly pray earnestly pray and tap into God obey what he's telling you to do and it's going to release his compassion see that's what we've learned in Jonah is that turning to him releases his compassion he loves us he has compassion for us he wants to hear it all he wants us to climb up in his lap and tell him how we feel he can even take the anger and the stuff and the displease and look at it at Jonah and I'm not saying that's a model but I'm saying that when you get to that point, don't hide it from him. Give it to him. He, he, he can take it. He sees it all anyway. He's wanting you to talk to him from your true heart and tell him what's really going on. You know? So that's where we find ourselves is hoping and waiting. He said that this sickness will not end in death. You know, but the, the son, it all happened that God's son may be glorified through it. So I'm just trusting that he's going to glorify himself, you know, and that, that it's a chance for us all to know that he did it, you know. And I was thinking about all this, and it reminded me about cultivation. And I just kept thinking about cultivation and, and that waiting cultivates us. See, waiting plows us up. Waiting churns us up. Well, I just did that yesterday to some other patches. I planted my second round of, of fall greens and, and the lettuces and the turnips and all this stuff. And, you know, I had to work up some ground that was hard. And, and what I realized is that the hard ground, it, it was is ugly. It didn't even look pretty anymore. 
he, uh, I'd read a quote before. It said, untilled ground, however rich, will bring forth thistles and thorns. So also with the mind of man. St. Teresa of Avila wrote, wrote that. And it's untilled ground. I, listen to this. Untilled ground, however rich, will bring forth thistles and thorns. So also with the mind of man. See, we don't get churned up. We can't hold any seed. See, the, the word is seed. And for the heart of man to hold that, a lot of times we have to get churned up. Growth happens in the suffering. And then we carry that through in the good times. But see, you, you can't, you, your heart can't hold this seed most of the time if it's hard, if, it, if, if it's in prosperity. Things got to get churned up for, for the human heart to hold this seed. And I started thinking about that with the stuff I was working up yesterday. And I could have thrown down my seed on top of that hard ground. It, it wouldn't have done anything. I, I've been doing this long enough to know. Yeah, you'd have something sprout up, but you wouldn't get any fruit be useless be a waste of soil and and there was a lot of weeds starting to pop up in the in the hard soil it was it's rich soil it's great i've been working on it for 10 years but however rich it is it's only going to bring forth the stuff that's that's not fruitful if it's not tended and cultivated and worked on so that's what the lord's doing you know i i gotta know that that's what he's doing in this community by by the threat of losing this radio station he's he's getting us all churned up and i'm i'm excited about it i'm excited about it in my own life because i i'm so churned up right now and i'm so cultivated you know that i think i can hold some seed and that's what i thought about too after i worked up all these beds at my house and worked them up and got the old stuff churned it all up and replanted the stuff man it looks pretty you know, and I'm just hopefully now waiting for the stuff that I sowed to pop up. And Lord willing, I'll be selling it at farmer's market before too long, you know, and it might be a couple months. But that's what we're hopeful. We're waiting on that. The Lord's never let me down. Every time that I've ever worked up the soil, every mm -hmm. time I've ever planted it right, He's always given me a crop. So, I just have to trust that I've done my part and that now it's in his hands. And if he wants me to have a crop, he's going to give me a crop. If he doesn't want me to have a crop, he's got something better in mind. Sometimes he's done that to me before where he shut down a crop only to show me that he wanted me to grow something else in that space that would be more fruitful. And I would have never understood that at the time. And I was locked on to my way of thinking, I'm going to do it this way. And he said, well, it didn't work there. So I had to try something else, and then I got triple the fruit. See, his ways aren't our ways.